All right, everybody's back. Very good. So, um, what did you find out? Um, how are you doing on these on these items? What do you think? So I guess I could go first and um, Thank specifically you. I'll touch uh, with the second item. Uh, so as a molecular biology grad student, I've had to, you know, synthesize a whole bunch of information from different sources, um, you know, like uh, uh, primary literature and whatnot to be able to uh, design a coherent experiment that I'm currently undertaking mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Are you saying molecular biology? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the, the HSS degree is not really, it's not really you then, is it? Uh, no, but I signed up for this talk specifically because I was interested in why um, uh, people would find this field interesting. Oh, and I think okay. it's always interesting to, uh, to, to branch out into, you know, like why people choose the career path they do. All right. Very good. Very good. Um, okay. I didn't know I had an outsider in the group. Uh, <laughs> an outsider. Like, we'll keep you. We'll keep you. We'll keep you. Uh, please don't ostracize me too <laughs> <Okay>. much. <laughs> Um, anybody, anybody else? Um, how do you think you're doing on these on these items? Is that something that's actually happening? Please. Um, I haven't I haven't yes. thought actively about it so much, but um, after looking at them, I do think I am, you know, by going through the courses and um, applying myself in the classroom. I think that I have been developing. I think most of these are we've been focusing or building those skills throughout through the natural coursework i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um can you can you give me an illustration an example of any of <laughs> yeah sure um uh for example like um talking about the the i think the second point um you know i'm working in history and you know every class having to read lots of different sources and mm -hmm. uh collaborate with group members to, mm -hmm write papers or develop our own arguments based on the information, the lots of different complex information mm -hmm. that we get. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, for I think we're definitely hitting a lot of these points with that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you, Ben, thank you. Um, any other thoughts, Jade? What do you think? Are you doing these? Uh, yes, definitely. A um, Couple different things. Right now I'm taking a seminar in popular music and we're reading mm -hmm. about maybe three to four pretty dense um, articles per week mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. writing about them. Um, every semester I've taken a seminar and we've pretty much had to write maybe like 15 to 20 page research-based papers. Right. Um, and I'm finishing up my master's this coming spring. So I've been researching and working on my own final mm -hmm. project. Can I ask you, what's your, what's your program? I am a music education. Okay, all right. So, can you give me an example of a um, of a popular music of a popular song, which is a pop song, I guess, um, that um, people may not fully appreciate, but that you can lay out in maybe more detail? Is, is am I thinking the right way here about what you're doing? Yeah, oh, the current seminar actually our focus has been on authenticity mm -hmm. and whether or not. Um, whether or not you agree with authenticity. So we actually kind of had our last class today and we had to debate whether or not uh, either in favor of authenticity or against it. What is the definition of authenticity? What mm -hmm. makes a song authentic and looking at it from a first, second and third person perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so something that might be good to me and authentic to myself as the second person listener could be, you know, any one of my classmates is really into Taylor Swift. So for her, she can listen to that and that's pop music, right? Mm -hmm. And for her, that's a very authentic experience. Um, but maybe, I mean, I happen to like that, but maybe for me in a different instance, Mm -hmm. I might find that that performer to be inauthentic, so I'm I might not relate to it. Okay, yeah. So um, that particular the ability to say maybe talk about Taylor Swift in a way that is unexpectedly more complex and yes. and challenging than at first it would appear, because uh, yeah, I mean she would she wouldn't be the first name that to pop up for a maybe a a complex conversation about the meaning of popular music. Yet, if you have sort of a 
deeper understanding of the body of knowledge, you can bring that example in and maybe lay out in a little more finesse about why this question of is Taylor Swift actually, is, is, is it a fraud, is it a production or is it a true, truly felt musical experience? That is a more sophisticated debate that an MA can have and that really brings a professional level to a particular subject, right? So um, let me ask you, Maximiliano, um, do you have a particular item here when you think you actually really are making progress? Uh, I would say number two, which is kind mm -hmm. of started as an undergrad as well. I was a psych major currently doing my social work, mm -hmm. but as a psych major, I was doing research under a professor and just being able to kind of go through articles and conceptualize what the authors are trying to say. Mm -hmm. how it applies to our current research and what implications we could suggest to future research mm -hmm. um, is something that I definitely think I have developed over the years. Yeah, and actually that's, that's really true for psychology, which is really, um, in many of its methods, very close to, um, to the sciences familiar to health and human development. You know, if you read, for example, a psychology paper on um, maybe, you know, the brain processes for in schizophrenia, uh, I mean, that would be, that would be something that um, seems miles away from the work of a philosopher, yet we are in the same house in the humanities and social sciences, in many ways, um, you know, reading about um, um, serotonins and their roles and in, in, um, in, in at normal psychology uh, that goes closer to Sebastian's field of molecular molecular biology. So um, there you can bring a level of professional expertise to it that allows you to actually talk about that subject, not like someone who had this in college as a course, but who actually can speak competently on the subject. So competence on the knowledge is something that you're all developing. The ability to communicate this um, in an appropriate level is also something that you should be working on. And you should, you should sort of, I don't wanna turn you into nags that complain to the professors that they're not teaching enough, um, but this list of skills should, um, should be dear to you uh, because these are the things that actually um, turn you from a student into a professional. So the ability to talk about your work competently um, without sounding like this is your first year doing this, that's a worthwhile skill. You should push on that and you should look for opportunities to make that happen. Teamwork is something that a lot of professors fail to really emphasize and it's a hard thing to teach. It's much easier and I, I confess that I, it's easy for me to offer the opportunity for teamwork. It's not something that I can easily teach all that well. So this is um, where you need to look for opportunities that this actually happens. Um, the synthesis and evaluation of complex materials is something that is part of your graduate work, of course. Um, but then the final point, um, or the last point, the, the, the fifth point and the sixth point are also important. Um, knowing the methods and technologies of your field. So um, how, do you, how do you approach a subject? Can you articulate what, you, what it is that you do as a, an historian when you wanna answer a question? And that's actually something that we often have a hard time with, um, especially in the, in, the, in the humanities. The social sciences have methodologies that are laid out fairly clearly. Um, you can do a research project or you conduct a double blind study and the methodology there is laid out. It's literally a process of developing data. Um, again, a little closer to Sebastian's field, but um, for a historian to explain their method, how do they um, think about their subject can often be incredibly challenging because we think, well, I just researched and tried to come up with an answer and then we kind of we, we puzzle a little on the question of methodology. How do we, how do we think about the past? I think, well, I think about it. That's not enough, of course. All right, so that's where um, you as students, and I'm focusing on history here, not only because I'm a history professor, but also because Drizelle and Ben are history graduate students, where you as students need to constantly push, not just yourself, but also the professors to sort of uh, find ways to become more articulate, articulate on the methodologies you employ. Finally, social responsibility within diverse communities and an interdependent global community. That sounds to some 
as maybe the kind of language that we bring in there in order to make sure that we are being, um, that we are serving a, a, a larger purpose than ourselves. And so as to um, maybe distract from the fact that maybe everybody gets their MA in a particular degree for their own advancement, because this is what we want for ourselves. Um, and that we are sort of putting some veneer here on social purpose, but that's not really the case. Um, there is actually um, a, a point to say Maximiliano um, doing research and being able to talk about the way his work matters to the world around him. Whether this will then matter to his career or not is another matter. It can easily do so. Um, for Jay to connect um, her own way of thinking and talking about music um, may matter if she becomes a writer and talks about music to an audience and educate them about um, the significance of what they hear and make their hearing and um, listening experience more meaningful. Um, and for Ben and Drizel, um, they might be able to talk about, and I'm going to pick up a random sample here, the significance of the Cold War um, to the world that we live in today um, in very concrete terms um, that speak to those who are white and prosperous middle class on the American East, on the, on the um, US East Coast, or to say refugees communities um, from Afghanistan on their way into the European Union and explain to each of these groups in very different terms uh, where the Cold War um, shaped the world that they live or have to suffer in. So those are actually meaningful goals, not just veneers we put on in order to look a little bit more uh, broad-minded. So I, I would encourage you to to, you know, here, this is a clickable, well, I guess it's not clickable for you, is it? Um, let's see, maybe I can put that in the, um, in the chat. Um, am I allowed to copy from my own? No, I'm not. I'm going to do that later. Uh, I'm going to put some things in the chat at the end that you can then um, copy and link to and download for yourself. Um, so boiling this down one more time to a, to a short list of, of things you're getting from your MA, it's knowledge, it's a skill, meaning research or in writing, and it's a method, it's a way of thinking. Now, what do you think um, for your career, which of these three or four um, sets of, um, of, of um, deliverables you get out of your education are the most important for your, for your career? What do you think is the most important of these four or three? Anyway, the most important to me would probably be knowledge. Okay, knowledge. Say. All right. You to, like, if you're like undertaking like any like original research, you need to like know the rules of the game, you know, okay. before you start reworking them. I'll hold on to that. I'll hold on to that answer because I'm going to pick up on that later. Uh, what do you? What else? Um, yeah, in the group. What do you think? What do you think is the most important thing? Jade, what do you think? What's the most important part of your MA education? Knowledge, skill, method? Um, so I'm trying to think of, I, I teach full time. I teach um, secondary school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to think of in regards to my daily classroom. Uh, I think probably the most important thing for me lately has been research because what mm -hmm. I've been researching, I've been applying in the classroom. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, the skill, the, the ability to research and know how to get stuff. All right. Okay. Uh, what do you think, Ben? Yeah. Um, I also, I also teach too as well. Um, and thinking about how I use it. Yeah. For me, it's not so much, of course, knowledge is important, but I think um, conveying like English or historical topics to kids, it feels more like I use a lot of the methodologies method? okay. more often. Right. You pick method. All right. Yeah. Now, now Drizel, Maximiliano, where do you stand? I think for oh, me would be, oh, sorry. You go first. I think you would be research and writing. Research and writing, okay, Maximiliano. 
honestly, coming from like a research perspective, I think they're all important. You need to know okay. like the knowledge of how you acquire stuff, the yeah. skill of how you do it, and the method also created empirically important. So, so you refuse to make a priority. Yeah. Right, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So um, I think um, the way I see this is knowledge is immediately important. You need to have knowledge right away. To, you know, that's, that matters. Uh, but the skill of expanding your knowledge is, is really important. So um, you want to research more. You, you, you have some knowledge. I mean, Drizel is well, right now with me is reading um, a set of, what is it, 14 books on um, the United States um, and its history and, and the history of its relationship to the rest of the world. Those 14 books are full of stuff. I mean, there's a lot in there to know. Um, some of it, she, yeah, some of it she will retain. Uh, much of it she will not, neither will I. Um, can we hope to just sort of fill ourselves with knowledge and then walk around with full vessels carefully to not tip over? That can't be the plan, right? Knowing how to find and build and rebuild um, your knowledge, that's probably more important. So if Giselle at the end of the semester comes in uh, to my office hours and has forgotten most of the details in those 14 books, I won't be upset. But if the concepts in there, I mean, I'll be a little bit upset, but if uh, the concepts in there that we talked about, about how these things relate, if that's all gone uh, and some of the concepts we talked about, and if that's not there, um, and if she, then, I'm, then, then I'm more worried. Um, if the way she thinks about it, the method of her thinking is not at all affected by any of these books, then I would say the class has failed. So if she doesn't recall the, um, the prime minister of, um, of Nigeria, right at Nigeria, and right after independence, that's fine. You can you can Google that. But if she doesn't know why it would matter, um, the way Nigeria became independent, um, and roughly what was at stake there, the method in which in which she sort of puts these bits of information together, that would be a problem. If she, after graduating, wouldn't know how to find another book on that subject, or um, if say if let's say she would work in Washington D.C. Um, at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, as a staff uh, member and occasional research on a topic to prepare, say, a, a senator's um, a briefing on a particular nation. If she didn't know how to research that, that would be a real issue. And then if she wouldn't know how to write a summary of that research, that would be the real problem. So even though we tend to think about our education as mostly as the acquisition of knowledge, fill us up, give us stuff to know. That, in the long run, is the least important part of your education. Really, what you learn in college and in your MA is the ability to learn. You learn how to learn. Because anywhere you go, you will anywhere you want to go that's worthwhile going, you will learn more. That's the essence of higher education versus a trade school. At a trade school, you, you acquire a, set of, a certain set of knowledge and then some skills. You go out, apply it, you work it on the job. Occasionally, maybe you need some, uh, some retraining, a new machine comes in or a new a new concept, then you get through some retraining and then you apply yourself and then you, you just work, work your skills, work a set of knowledge, a certain set of knowledge. But that's, that's not really what higher education does for you. Higher education means to prepare you for a lifelong development on your job where you constantly learn something new. And that's the concept of lifelong learning. Imagine right now you're a graduate student. So books are part of your life, right? Um, almost certainly, um, sometimes you will chafe under the burden of books. Um, books you have to read um, or books you have to really work for class. Um, Giselle knows what I'm talking about in the directed reading class where you need to read a book a week. Um, it's not all pleasure. Um, so you need to work these books and sometimes maybe you're looking forward to a time where you no longer have, have to read in that way. But imagine ending up in a job where you never ever have to read a book again. 
Imagine working a job where they say, hey, what you know is enough. You, know, you don't need to know anything else. That's all you need to know. You have the knowledge, that's good. Nothing else needed, just go do it. Does that sound good to you? I've had plenty of those jobs. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, have yeah, them. Yeah. Do you want more of them? No, sir. <laughs> no, that's why you're here, right? Um, you are here because you want to, and I'm sorry, Jorge, for somehow skipping you in the past with my questions. I think the lack of, the, uh, of an image made me sort of skip you over. I, I will make sure to ask you next time. Um, the point of your MA is to have a job where you never know everything, but need to know more. That's what you're looking for. Um, this is this is true for my job. If if I, I mean I teach a class that I've taught for 15 years, but after three years or so, I want to teach it differently. I don't want to tell the same thing every semester, do I? I mean, some things remain the same. There is a foundational core that sort of remains fairly stable, but I want to do other things. Maybe I don't want to constantly teach it in a large lecture hall. Next time I want to teach it in a different way. I want to change it up. If you are looking forward to a lifelong career, um, what you're looking forward to is lifelong change in your skills, in your knowledge. What remains stable or what remains most stable over your lifelong career path is the method, the way you think, the way you make sense, how you, how you grasp the world. Right? So Maximiliano, the psychologist, will always think of a particular problem differently than Rizal does as an historian. So if we take, for example, the refugees that are currently stuck um, between Poland and Belarus, um, if you follow that story. Maximiliano will look at um, maybe the traumas suffered, uh, maybe amongst children, the symptoms of abandonment and how they translate into particular um, abnormal psychological patterns um, or other maybe need for treatment um, in extreme cases, maybe, um, pharma maybe pharmaceuticals, but most likely um, cognitive or behavioral therapies or psychodynamic therapy, that kind of thing. That's how Maximiliano will approach the problem. Griselle will go there and um, she will look at this as an outcome of a, of a crisis of stability and political regimes in say Afghanistan or, um, or Syria, and will connect this to a political history that made these regions crisis centers um, for the last um, 30 years or so, right? And, and Jorge, um, remind me, what is your program? Education. Okay, and education. Uh, so you're also an outsider. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so uh, Jorge, I don't know how you will address um, the refugees stuck between Poland and Belarus. Maybe you can tell me what would be your method? How are you looking at that? <laughs> I'd probably go back to my political science undergraduate degree to <laughs> think about that. Yeah. Well, the spitball here, you might look at that as a, as a situation where you are needed to prepare and educate um, these, these refugees communities on how to um, how to navigate their new life, um, what kind of skills they need to develop, um, learning skills to cope with the transition to um, maybe settling down in Poland, which they don't really, which they're not really going for, or settling down in Germany, which is almost certainly where they're hoping to, to land at the end. Um, and um, maybe uh, look at the educational challenges for integrating these um, these refugees in Germany. So a quick language learning program um, would be your project there, right? So you all, there's one, there's one crisis, one problem. You all come at this with different things that you have to offer, not because you know this right now, right? Um, chances are you know very little about these refugees between Belarus and Poland at the moment, but you know what you could do. You have a method of thinking. That makes you special. Okay. This makes Maximiliano different from Ben. Um, Prasad, I'm sorry, I also overlooked you in, in my past questions. Um, Prasad, what's your program? Uh, actually, it's uh, interdisciplinary, uh, civil engineering, and environmental science. God, we are just inundated with outsiders here. This is outrageous. Um, I, 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 did you guys listen to my opening where I kind of disparaged your colleges? I hope, I hope you weren't there for that. Yes. All ears for that. Okay, well, 
I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> um, I think um, I, I, th I think you would agree with me that you know for you, Prasad, in did you say engineering? In, Prasad, did you say engineering is your is your program? Yeah, uh, okay. actually environmental sciences, but it's an interdisciplinary okay. one. So I do civil engineering and environmental science and technology. Okay. So, so um, yeah. So, um, uh, Prasad, I'm sure you would agree that when you told your parents, I'm not sure whether that's appropriate, whether what age you are, but let's say you told your parents you want to do um, an international interdisciplinary program with environmental science and engineering, they didn't say what for, right? Uh, no, actually, this is uh, my decision. <laughs> that was your decision. Um, yeah. Now that I see your picture. Um, I can see why maybe this was uh, I'm, I'm sorry about uh, parental consent issue, um, but I think you get my point. Um, in these, in in a lot of other colleges and programs, the direction, the path you're taking in terms of career is fairly firm. In humanities and social science, not so much. So that's the point of this whole exercise here. Um, I will say um, that for you, Prasad um, and Sebastian and um, um, Roger in education, the, the apparent certainty or obvious choices that lie before you for your colleges um, 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 for your college are, can be misleading um, and actually lead you to think that you have a set set of skills and knowledge that make that allow you to plug yourself into a job and be steady and sturdy there. The truth is, is, is not like that. Um, you also will find that the MA or the MS, Prasad, I'm assuming it's an MS that you're pursuing. Yeah. Um, they are also meant to be lifelong learning qualifications. So you will always, you will, you will always learn more. You will get a job where at first you have to learn a little and then you are good at this. And then if you want to get a, get a, move ahead and find a new job, you need to learn something else. So you will come home after work and still read and still research online and still build new qualifications. Oh, uh, uh, well, I plan on pursuing a, a PhD after my master's year. So hopefully, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll still be enamored with uh, with reading by then. Well, certainly the formal context where you know you are required to, otherwise you're not passing. But even, even say for me as a PhD, um, Every day, I learn something new. Um, I don't teach the same reading class uh, because I don't want to teach the same book. So um, with very few exceptions, do I try to repeat books in order to save myself time. So the next time I'm going to teach a US history reading class, I will pick new sets of books that I haven't read so that I get to read them. Um, if I want to write a new article, I research in order to learn something new I did not learn before. Right? So once you get the PhD, actually your lifelong mission will be to learn and learn and learn. People misunderstand what PhDs do. They think we all we teach. That's one half. The other half is we constantly are learning. And we are actually obligated to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that I heavily empathize with that too, because um, I've never looked at, a, 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 you know, me obtaining a PhD as uh me becoming a, a a university professor or anything like that but me you know essentially becoming a lifelong student and yeah. and that's what i'm kind of committing myself to that's often what in popular culture is misunderstood about what a professor is right and if you i don't know let's say you um you what do i watch i watch things like law and order svu and they're up there at hudson university um, if you watch Law and Order, you know that everything's always at Hudson University. Um, these professors, they always walk around with the books, mostly their own books that they have written. And they are just these, um, you know, they sprinkle knowledge out all over. They just disperse it. They have it, they give it. That's what their job is, to disperse knowledge because they just stuff with it. But most professors are constantly asking themselves questions and trying to learn something. That's, I will tell you, is a good decision um, not just because it makes your lifelong work more interesting. It's also a good decision health-wise. And actually, I learned this from reading psychology texts, that the more cognitively challenging your work is, the more healthy, um, basically, your, your cognitive system will be in the long run. 
So um, work that remains cognitively challenging, where you constantly have to acquire new um, sets of information and skills, actually means that mentally you all are going to be disproportionately healthier than the average population. That's a good thing. So um, I want to now give you some examples of how you can translate, say, for example, a body of knowledge into a career. Now, for Prasad uh, and Sebastian and Jorge, if these examples don't seem to make any sense, forgive me, I am talking specifically to the HSS students. But of course, um, there is um, there, there will be overlaps. I hope you can see that. Um, how do you identify what is your body of knowledge? Um, your degree may be a little bit too broad, you know, for example, for Drizelle and Ben to just have an MA in history. Uh, good Lord, please don't go and ask them historic trivia questions. Most, most likely they will not be able to answer you. Don't ask me historical trivia questions because I probably won't be able to answer you. I can inundate you with my own trivia, but I'm not, I'm not a walking encyclopedia. As I said earlier, we are not just vessels of knowledge, right? Um, so maybe your best or your favorite class um, that you took. Um, for Maximiliano, maybe, I don't know, what's been your best, your, your most favorite class in psychology? Uh, it would be between abnormal psych or advanced stats. Okay. Um, I just I just worked through a abnormal psychology textbook by Nolan. Do you know that one? I don't. Okay. Um, I, so I learned a lot about abnormal psychology and I find it fascinating. It's really interesting. Um, and if I had time, I would read it more. Um, so yeah, so maybe you are really particularly, um, there was a chapter on, um, on ethics and law and abnormal psychology, you know, what's a civil commitment, what's an involuntary commitment, maybe you really want to drill down on this and become the expert on the legal cases that determine um, under which circumstances someone can be committed against their will, um, or under which circumstances a therapist is obligated to inform um, authorities about a dangerous patient, those kind of skills, that maybe makes you, gives you a particular body of knowledge. Maybe there's a successful research paper that you wrote where you really feel like, man, I really drilled down on this. I know this stuff now. Even the professor was kind of impressed with how much I was able to dig up. Did anyone have an experience like that? Maybe yeah, still coming. Uh, professor, uh, I, I had, uh, because I'm working with uh, Dr. Sudarshan, an engineering department. So we are writing like, uh, I took this uh, research class um, it's about mathematical modeling. So mm -hmm. we did, um, he gave me the chance to write a book chapter, but you know, I was writing, but I couldn't finish it on time mm -hmm. because of the duration. Now um, he's kind of mentoring me to write book chapters and um, you know, research and reading papers mm -hmm. towards the PhD. So um, mm -hmm. you know, I had a good experience with him yeah. and it's not just writing, uh, like you know, using software to uh, write papers. Um, and yeah, I, I did like, you know, a couple of papers, those were not published, but it's uh, like class level. Yeah, but mathematic mo mathematical modeling, Yeah, you can say, hey, I, I can do this. I, I know what's required. And in, you know, environmental engineering, um, if there's a job that requires that kind of skill, you can demonstrate you have that body of knowledge um, to apply. I'm being brought in, I'm sure maybe in the back of your head, you think this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And of course, you're right. I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm <laughs> just giving you an example there. Um, maybe you had an intense reading seminar or independent study. Maybe Drizel really, you know, read these books so deeply that she feels, you know what? I can actually now go to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in Washington, D.C., um, start maybe with an internship through D.C. scholars, which we do, right? And um, then in my day-to-day in, in work at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, apply a lot of the knowledge that I have from these books, where I really understand on a much deeper level um, what these foreign affairs issues are about. Or you want to work in the State Department under, and I love saying this, Abe Lincoln. Its name is, of course, A. Lincoln, but I like, I like calling our Secretary of State Abe Lincoln. Um, maybe there's a personal passion um, that connects you to your field, something in particular that you found um, you know, intensely interesting, and um, that is what got you into that, um, into that particular topic. Jerry, you said you're in education. Jade stepped away. Um, Jade's in education. Oh, she's back. Yes, no, uh, 
Yes, I teach. My undergrad was in music education and vocal performance. Mm -hmm. And then my master's is in music education. Are you a singer? I am. I thought you might. Um, so you have a passion for something like that, and that drives you to become a further expert in the field. Um, and that gives you a body of knowledge. Uh, and in your case, Jade, also a particular set of skills, right? Singing. It's not that easy. Um, people often misunderstand that. I'm going to give you an example now of a graduate student who had a particular passion. And I want you to see whether you can figure out what discipline, um, what MA that person has. Um, Eric Ortega um, got his degree in 2015. He works at Drake's Brewery in Northern California. He started with leading an employee beer education program and then now works generally in that company. Um, what, what HSS degree do you think he had? <laughs> beer Meister? I don't know. <laughs> we, we don't have a department of beer meistering. No, no, we don't have that. <laughs> yes, and you're chuckling because you think, well, what student isn't interested in beer? But he wasn't, I mean, he actually was interested in understanding beer, not just drinking it. So what do you think was his, uh, his degree? So Chemistry? Hmm? Chemistry? If it was a non-HSS degree, I would say biology because he was interested in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but you specifically mentioned H, uh, uh, HSS, so yeah. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's history. And you're guessing that because I'm a history professor and that's why I know that. I know, it's right? because, you know, just to, uh, you know, like if you, if you need to brew, uh, you know, to get the right flavors and the colors and you need to know the history of the beer tasting and the beer production. So I thought that it's nice to have, you know, history majoring. I don't know, this is in here. This you is are right, crazy. you are right. Um, <laughs> Eric, uh, he wrote his, um, his history MA. Um, uh, he, was, he, was, he was a hobby, he was a hobby beer brewer. He just loved the whole science of it and how it worked. He read on his own about the history of beer, um, how it looks different in different parts of the world and you know, how it's done, where the techniques come from. And he ended up writing a history MA on the rise of independent craft breweries in 1960s California, um, how that was part of sort of an authenticity, um, not to you, Jade, authenticity movement in food that tried to counter um, sort of mass corporate food production, um, you know, at the time where, you know, all companies had names like General Mills, you know, produced big, big batches of beer that everybody drank, big batches of bread that everybody ate. The 60s were sort of the, the counter trend to that, where they wanted things done craft by craft by non-industrial methods. And he researched that paper and he made himself an expert on the beer industry in California. And then he basically toured the state because he wanted to work for a brewery, but there wasn't a job written for him uh, because no one said, we want someone who just knows a lot about beer. It's not a job description, um, but he just sort of applied and sort of introduced himself to 15 different breweries. And Drake said, man, we don't know anybody who knows this much about what we actually do here. Uh, it would really be a shame to let that person go. Um, so they hired him and they invented a position for him. And that was um, the employee beer education program. And trust me, this is not a standard position that you have uh, in breweries. And um, that sort of transitioned it into just being part of this, of this, of this team of, of, um, of brewers at Drake's. The point I'm trying to make here is that he had a particular passion, a particular interest, and he made sure that he stuck to that and made it a career. Not in the first step. It, in the first step, it was a job. And then out of that, he built a career. So this is a point where you, ideally, you have a piece of paper and you have a in, and um, you take a minute and think, okay, what is it that I'm really passionate about? Now, Jade, singing. Um, so maybe for Jade, her work is in, well, what might be, what would be a commercial enterprise where singing 
um, matters. You could be uh, in a talent agency. Um, you could be um, with a recording studio. Now the recording industry, I understand, is not really what it was 15 years ago, but it still exists somewhere, right? Um, maybe um, with an advertisement agency that needs to find the right music for the right product. You know, it's something that sounds and feels authentic and you, Jade, would understand this better than others. Um, this is where you need to think about, okay, what, what is it that I really care about and how can I turn this into a job? Um, that's my first recommendation for you always to think about something that you love, that you're passionate about and see how you can make that into a job. Even if at the beginning, it's just a job, build that then into a career. Right. That's what the, uh, that's what Eric did, um, and and others have done as well. Here's another example um, of um, of someone, um, Raymond Ortiz, and here I'm not going to keep you guessing because this is another history student. Eric uh, was a history student, but not necessarily a history student because he liked the past. He didn't really. Um, do the field because he wanted to know everything there was to know about King, about Henry VIII. Um, and I don't think he cared particularly about the Romans or the Greeks, but he was really fascinated by um, gender relations over the course of history um, and race relations over the course of history. And there, of course, he has a lot um, in common with other people in humanities and social sciences where um, gender, race, and class dimensions um, or, or questions of sexuality are a major um, topic of interest for us. And so he really got invested in causes in um, promoting, say, racial justice or um, um, awareness about uh, sexual diversity or um, gender equity. That, that, these all became issues that were really sort of dear to him. And so as a result, he wanted to work in a field that was driving these kind of issues and agendas. Um, um, and I didn't mean this disrespectfully agenda, I'm just saying that it's it, uh, priorities um, with, uh, with a way of making, of, of making a living out of that. And so he found a, a firm um, that actually organized fundraising and consulting for nonprofits, nonprofits that might not have their own fundraising resources or fundraising staff, maybe small museums or historical landmarks, social justice projects. They needed someone who would help them generate revenue for, for their cause. And he ended up working for them. So he, in a way, found himself in the financial sector and in the marketing sector, but because he cared so much about something that he studied in history. So again, this is nothing that you would have put on top of the list at our first slide where I said, what's the obvious job for an HSS student, right? Fundraising? Uh, no, not necessarily. But there you are. This is, what, this is what he ended up quite directly as a result of his passion in history. Now, outside of the body of knowledge, there are also skills that you develop in research. So, um, these research skills will be different for you, Maximiliano, um, or you, Jade, or, um, or Drizel, or for our outside visitor, visitors, Jade, Prasad, and Sebastian, um, and Jorge. Um, you know how to acquire a certain knowledge. You know how to do that. You don't know yet, but you know how to get it done. And that's sometimes all you need to demonstrate. Um, Daniel Barbeau was also one of my students, um, and he wrote his MA. Well, now he's in the Foreign Service Office, um, in the Foreign Service as an officer with the State Department. Um, what do you think might have um, been his history MA? Just a guess, just a wild guess. What do you think might have been the topic of his MA? This is not Cold a class. War. You did it wrong, hmm? Jorge? Cold War. The Cold War. Cold War. Yeah. Reason reasonable guess. Yeah. Well, no. He um, he wrote his paper on the debate of the gold standard in California after the Civil War. No connection at all to what he's doing now, but what they saw in him was his ability to research and tease out something about a subject um, that otherwise nobody knew much about. And so it was his skills, not his knowledge, right? Not his knowledge about foreign, um, about, um, foreign affairs as the State Department deals with it, but the way in which you acquire knowledge if you need it. Um, so as a result, he found himself first um, um, working on the East Coast and then later he was deployed 
um, sometimes undercover in Afghanistan. And I um, had him in class for Zoom on occasion, but sometimes he couldn't because he his location could not be disclosed. So the research abilities that he had that he had demonstrated with his MA made him suitable for a job where research is your day-to-day, where it's about bridging the gap from not knowing to knowing. So if you can work a database or really know how to handle databases very well, know how to mine digital or physical archives, um, maybe identify people that know better. You know, if you want to, um, you know, investigative journalists, they need to know, you know, if they do, then they need, Investigative journalists need to know what's public record. You know, where can I find out who owns this property? Where can I find out what taxes they pay? Um, how can I determine and figure out what sort of political donations a particular personality has has made in the past? These kind of things. Can you research them? Can you find them? Do you know how to do that? That makes you a good researcher. Um, can you conduct surveys? Uh, maybe for Maximiliano in, in psychology, that's more important to, you know, maybe do a study where um, you have to apply certain surveys, um, one with, you know, maybe I don't, control group stuff. You're the, you're, you're the expert there. Um, you know how to do that. Um, and that may be something that a marketing firm would really need. Or um, maybe a political... Uh, a political office wants to really figure out what the constituents are most interesting and interested in. And Maximiliano can make sure that he can conduct a survey where he finds just the information that they need. Dr. Jensen? Yeah. I, I like that quick question. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I've been uh, like applying online to different jobs related to education, specifically mm-hmm. to what I'm studying in education. And I put down that I already had a master's degree just to see what, what it could get me. And I mm-hmm. got no response, no responses at all. But once, and I put master's degree in from Cal State Fullerton. And one thing that kind of hit, hit me about your presentation so far is when you talked about the Ivy League schools, because once I changed it to USC, then suddenly I got a bunch of replies back about, oh, we'd like to mm-hmm. interview mm-hmm. you and this and that. Um, it's funny that USC would generate that interest because I, 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 I've I taught at UC, USC for two years and I, um, I got to tell you, um, it's, it's decidedly just the name. Um, I, I, I'm surprised it's a fairly dangerous game you're playing there because now someone's actually interested in you and they find out that that's not a sincere application. So mm-hmm. they said doors you clearly are willing to shut behind you. Um, mm-hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> I would be careful with sending things out uh, with those kind of um, those kind of details. And um, there are certain positions where, um, where there's a bias towards particular names of schools. Um, but in in a lot of jobs, um, in most jobs today, in HR, there's a particular method to this where this kind of selectivity comes up later. And um, to figure out why you didn't get any response needs a little more time and to see well, how I did you get, write I can give you another example. My brother just finished his uh, computer science degree at USC. And I have mm-hmm. a friend who just finished a computer science degree at Cal State Fullerton. My brother ended up working with Amazon and my other friend who I went to Cal State Fullerton is still looking for work. Right. So... I don't quite know how to how to address that question without really being able to compare those two applications. Um, mm-hmm. um, you know, Amazon.com is not is not a school that sort of depends on Ivy League applicants um, for its labor pool. Um, that's decidedly um, the too big an organization to to sort of focus just on people um, from private universities or well, Ivy League universities. I guess it, my question is related to that you mentioned that people who go to these Ivy League schools have better opportunities. No, I said that um, that the promise of some of Ivy League schools is a particular social grooming and networking um, mm-hmm. that is basically prepared for them. And USC is, is, is particularly known for being a networking school. Other U- USC hires other USC. Um, mm. That kind of loyalty alumni show to their alma mater and, the, and recent graduates, um, that's something that they cultivated with money. 
Um, but does that mean that somehow the USC degree is the better buy? Well, absolutely not. Um, so I, I don't want to get down the pathway say it's all in the name of the school because that, that's not true. And, an, and, and um, a computer scientist um, from Council at Fullerton absolutely can work at Amazon and right now works at Amazon. I can guarantee you that mm -hmm. there's plenty of Cal State graduates working at Amazon this very moment um, and probably at Zoom making this happen. Um, so I, I didn't say that that's act, that that is the that that is crucial. It can be a variable, but it's just one variable. You know, I just uh, want to say one more thing. I was I, at a uh... I was at if I could get, because I had a train of thought here, I was going to, we, we can, no, we can finish okay. up with some questions and comments at the end. I'm almost done. All right. Um, so let me just get, get, to, get a couple of final points here. Um, so um, to return to this, here it is the research skill that got Daniel his job. Um, and you will know what, what you were good at as a researcher, what you can apply then. For, for a job. Um, ultimately, it's about, and here I'm picking up an example that I showed earlier, the way you think. So can you talk about, say, climate change, the future of democracy, the importance of infrastructure, the refugees at the Belarus border, as or fill in any other topic, as a sociologist or philosopher, geography, geographer, historian, and now for our non-HSS participants, um, educator, engineer, um, or biologist. Um, this is where you show your ability to work your MA for life. There are, of course, also your writing and speaking skills. And um, that shows in your ability to contextualize and summarize uh, materials like Maximiliano described earlier about his, um, his ability to sort of summarize a field. Um, based on the research he did on existing literature and existing research. Um, and um, the key here is not only to be able to talk about it, but to talk about it in a way that excites people uh, and gets them fascinated. Um, so can you make your particular approach to an issue fascinating? I think, you know what, we need an historian on this. Um, that's something that you want to think about now. Can you say, Drizelle, I'm trying to market you to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, as you can as you see. Can you talk to them in a way that makes you sound more useful and more original in your contribution than a political scientist? Because political scientists um, have a particular method of thinking that um, um, is, is, has a real, I don't want to say fixed set of techniques, techniques but um, it has um, some very clear sort of models on how to think about pol politics. Historians don't work with models, really. So you can really sort of come in sideways and take a whole new approach on a foreign affairs challenge, where maybe everybody else around the table as a political scientist sees it one way, and you, Drizel, say, mm, wait a second, here's what you're missing. Right. If you can make that, if you can talk about an issue that way, that makes them think, oh, we need to listen to her. That could also be true, say, for Amazon.com, right, where, um, you know, the computer scientists have obvious benefits to offer to Amazon.com, and they will immediately know why they're, why they're, um, why they're um, applying there. Um, for an historian to apply at Amazon.com requires for them to explain what they can bring to the company or their particular department or challenge and how they see, um, how they see that work. So um, they're you know, knowing a little bit of business history or the history of technology and change um, will give you, Giselle, probably a way to um, anticipate the long-term vulnerability of Amazon, even though right now it seems impossible to imagine how it could not be the most powerful retailer in the country, right? Uh, Giselle might look at it and say, historically, we've been there before. Sears looked unshakable. Look where it is now. So, um, you know, historical perspective there, even in the private market, can absolutely matter. In the end, you should think of lifelong learning as something that begins now. So, um, if you don't have your passion yet, like Eric Ortega has his beer, um, think about it now. If you don't have it, that's fine. Um, you, I think 
most of you are still under 30. Um, and a good number of you are under 25. So there is still room to develop um, particular interest. We don't feel do old, I'm 25. You're, you're 25, Sebastian? I feel old. <laughs> well, I think um, Prasad is a little older than you. Um, Prasad, how old are um, you? I'm 36. 36. Um, Jake, you've been teaching for a while. I'm 36. You're 36. Um, Roger, how old are you? 41. 41. See, so Sebastian, you, um, I guess it's all the, relative. Yeah, you're almost the baby in the bunch. Um, <laughs> I went to college at age 25 um, because I did other things after high school, and I returned to college at age 25, and I finished my PhD um, at 33 when I was 33 years old, and um, that still at that mo moment meant that I was going to work another 32 years in that job. That's a long time. So um, being 25 and not yet having a fixed plan is absolutely fine. The reason the college always talks to you about fast graduation is because they have other people wanting to get in the program and you need to get through the door. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the speed of the process that we need to think about as an institution. You as an individual, other than the fact that you don't want to lay on other people's pockets um, and cost other people money, or you don't want to be uh, working at Starbucks any longer, um, that's the motivation for you to finish in time. Um, but depending on how you feel about that, there's no pressure to find the career right now. Um, not at all. Um, what you want to do, though, um, while you are in your, in, in your education at Kelset Fullerton, is you want to do things other than just take classes. Um, you would be mistaken if you think that just completing a degree is the ticket to a, to, to a good career path. It is probably a ticket to a job, but to a career path, um, probably not so much. So do things that show that you care and interested about what you say you're interested in. So um, if your particular passion, let's say I'm going to pick on Rizal again as an example, let's say Rizal wants to tell people later that she's interested in politics um, and she only took courses in history, um, I say, okay, that sounds good. It is more compelling if, if Rizal is, for example, um, doing an internship at the Congress members' um, local district office or works um, at a political campaign at some point, or um, after an internship, say with Katie Porter in Orange County, works then in, this, in, in the office there, um, or is politically active on campus and trying to um, organize events on hot button issues. Um, those kind of things that show her engagement. You wanna do this, you wanna do this now, because that's often, how you can separate yourselves. While the BA is a vast crowd, the MA is not a tiny crowd. In fact, even the PhDs are not so small a crowd. Um, so in any case, you always need something else to sort of distinguish yourself. Um, internships are always a good path to go. Um, some of you may already be in better positions. Jade, you're already teaching. So this is not something that you really need to do. Um, but um, for Giselle, I don't know where you are. Are you teaching Giselle? No, you're a full-time student? No, I work at a nonprofit. You work at a nonprofit. Okay. So maybe you already know kind of where down the line you could put your um, your degree to work, right? So um, for those of you who haven't done an internship and are still open, that's one foot in the door. Um, or at least look through the window. Um, Part-time jobs in the right direction can be helpful. Um, volunteering is painful if you really need to work just to make ends meet and may feel like a tough thing to do, uh, but it can be extremely rewarding. Um, participation and maybe leadership of student organizations is a big deal as well. Um, we will talk next time more about researching your job market. Um, um, and I want to see next time um, some examples of how you um, basically speak for your degree and explain your special skills. Um, one thing that, and I'm talking here specifically to HSS um, students, is that we don't really know as HSS students how to advertise what we're good at. 
Um, uh, someone in biology can speak specifically to their skills and knowledge. Sebastian knows how to do that. Um, Prasad can talk about his engineering skills um, or his grasp of, of environmental science. Um, even Maximiliano, I think, in psychology will have an easy, easier time talking to um, the, the things that his degree confers upon him. Um, but in a lot of other HSS degrees and histories, particularly here, um, but philosophy has an even bigger burden. Um, those students don't necessarily always know how to say what they're good at. Um, and that's one thing that you need to know. Build connections. Uh, and connections are always built ideally through work rather than schmoozing. So internships, part-time jobs, volunteering, student organizations, those are the means by which you build uh, connections, um, not by just emailing people and say, I want to know you, so later you can help me. Um, that's not how connections work. Um, you wanna start using the Career Center um, and start um, seeing what they have to offer um, and build this from the ground up. And remember, and I'm talking here, um, as if you were all HSS students, you build your career from the ground up. The first job you take, um, you should not measure by whether it will pay the mortgage for a suburban home um, or whether it buys you an Audi um, or Tesla. The first job you take should, um, you should choose because of the experience that it offers and the other opportunities it opens up for you. Um, so is that job interesting, exciting? Are you learning something new? Are you getting your boots on the ground, your hands dirty, you know, pick other metaphors. Um, that's what you should look for in your first job as a, as a stepping stone, a point of departure for a career. No one should hope to get a job um, as an MA that instantly establishes comfortable living um, and income security for the rest of their lives. It can happen, but don't expect it. So next time, what I want to do, uh, and that's um, Saturday, actually, in the morning uh, on December 11th, next time, I want to be a little more concrete and do a, a workshop um, with hands-on opportunity where you can flesh out your ideas and build a postgraduate plan. Um, if you guys um, had high school fairly recently and you know what a career training semester looks like, uh, my daughter's doing this right now in ninth grade, um, we'll do a little bit of, a, a little bit of that um, where we really sort of try to think about what would your job applications look like and where will they go. So that's the plan for next time. Um, but now with whatever time we have left, we have an open forum here. So there's nothing that closes us down. Um, you can ask me your questions. I will um, stop the share briefly and then actually copy and paste this Qualtrics link here into um, the chat because I'm hoping that for those who are still here that you're completing um, a, um, a survey on this workshop, all right? So let me just quickly make that happen. And in the meantime, um, feel free to um, think about what questions you have for me. I know that um, 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 Jorge, you had a number of questions, but maybe there are others as well. So ask away. There comes the survey. All right, we have, and here is the um, UPS with your, um, I'm not sure that's the link anymore. Hold on, let me see if I get you the link. Um, are there no questions? Oh, well, earlier I had asked what your dissertation was specifically on, Doctor. Oh, yes. I, um, I wrote a dissertation on the um, rehabilitative programs in California prisons after World War II up to the 1970s. And uh, what exactly were you analyzing about them? Uh, well, the point I made was that World War II was sort of an, um, a, a changing of the, um, 
a changing of opportunities for for states um, for states to turn prisons into the correctional facilities that they had been dreaming about since the progressive years um, that they especially california had funds and means to really sort of build not just um, prison facilities but an actual institutional infrastructure um, and that a lot of the ways in which they thought about how to rehabilitate people came actually from the armed forces from the armed forces okay so this was more of a shift of like instead of just keeping people in in like a in like a brick box into actually yeah. like rehabilitating yeah. them into members yeah. of society yes and it, it, that 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 had been around for a long time that you know prison ought to do such sort to of basically do something better than just hold people um in behind bars but there was a particular change that came with world war ii in the post-war years where the agenda of rehabilitation was shaped by um, how soldiers experienced World War II and about the way in which Americans after World War II understood freedom in contrast to um, the Soviet bloc. Mm -hmm. And was this because of uh, like imprisonment of soldiers or like what was it primarily um, driven by? Well, uh, no, not so much about um, the I keep breaking my pens here. <laughs> um, not so much about the imprisonment of soldiers, but about the um, the way in which you maintain democratic principles in an undemocratic organization, such as the army. The army is not a democratic organization, but professes to and um, often does fight in the name of preserving democracy. How do you make that work? How do you keep people in in authoritarian organizations? Um, and yet teach them the values of a democratic society. That's the army. That's the question that the army asked itself during World War II. And that's um, the question that um, a lot of people brought from the army into California corrections. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Well, now, I, wanna, I wanna turn the conversation back to you. And this is because I don't, uh, as, as, as flattered as I am and you're interested in my dissertation, um, and um, I, I, this is this will be a book. Um, um, if, if all things willing, um, in, in by by the end of next year. Um, but I actually want to have this about the conversation about you, you guys, not so much about me. I'm not so concerned about my career. <laughs> so, what questions do you have? If you have none, that's fine. Um, um, in that case, I just hope that you will um, complete that survey there um, on the right in your chat. Please make sure to copy that. That's done. You have it? Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. And then I hope that I see you and many more um, for the second part where we do some hands-on work on, um, on sort of preparing for, preparing for job applications on December 11th. All right? Right. Okay, sounds great. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you all. Have a good night. Take care, Rizal. Bye, Maya, Jade. Bye. Bye.